Well, if you guys are all, all ready, let's, uh, are, are you guys ready to jump into this? Let's do yeah, that. we have. All right, perfect. Well, uh, so welcome back, everybody. This is, this is actually episode 30 of the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. And uh, as we're recording this, it is the end of May. And generally speaking, towards the end of May, that means that June is right around the corner. And in June in Colorado, one of the things that always seems to come up is the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. This year, I swear, June skipped like a couple months. It's coming earlier than usual. But um, I mean, here we are. We're right about to start uh, the month and getting ready to test for Pikes Peak. And now that we've kind of switched to the Zoom platform, what, what I had the idea was, well, what if we could reach out to a number of people that have, that have participated in the Pikes Peak Hill Climb and kind of have just a little bit of a, like a round table discussion about the Pikes Peak Hill Climb, just kind of as, you know, some of us are getting, you know, ramped up for it, getting ready for it, getting ready to start testing and, uh, and some other people that have got a lot of experience on the mountain. So just wanted to kind of bring some people in and have a conversation about it. So we've got a slew of special guests this time out. Um, let's see, I'll just go around on the screen here. So uh, we've got Annie Kingsley from Kingsley Motorsports. Uh, we've got Stefan Verdier, uh, Scott Crouch, who's our driver for the Pikes Peak car, uh, owner of Flatirons Tuning, Victor Coons, uh, DM Rally, who has done the Pikes Peak Hill Climb a number of times. We've got Tasso uh, from OTC Racing, who is yet to do the Pikes Peak Hill Climb. Am I right on that? That's true. I'm kind of the, the odd man out in this group. Yes. <laughs> well, but lots of hill climbs, lots of hill climb experience, just haven't done Pikes Peak yet. And we've got Dave Kern with us from, from is it Kern Racing or Kern Motorsports? Or does uh, I think, I think yes. last, uh, last it was Race Kern, but nice. I, think I, I let, the, let the website lapse. Yes. But, but Dave, you've, you've run Pikes Peak a number of times, and uh, I'm really glad we were able to, to grab you and get you to sit in with us on this. So yeah, thanks for making the time. Thanks. So as we kind of get started, one of the things I got to thinking about is, I mean, because Pikes Peak has changed through the years. It started out as a, as, a, as a dirt race for a long, long time. And then in about the last, let's call it last decade, it started to change where they started to pave it. And it's now to the point where it's a fully paved race. So one of the things I was thinking about, how many of you guys ran it when it was fully dirt, when it was a full dirt rally? I don't think uh, they did. I did. Us, did we? I think Sebastian's the only one. Oh, yeah. Stefan's the only one. It, I'll, I'll take Sebastian. Maybe they... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, you won it, didn't uh, you, Stefan? Yeah. Uh, the, that's when we did the, um, the rally. I think that was the first time I did it, when we did the rally, and we had uh, we actually ran from the tour booth yeah. to the start of the race on tarmac. Right. And then after that, the start of the race to the top was gravel. Right. Wasn't that a Rally America event? Yeah, yeah. Event? Oh, at the time it was, yes. Yeah. At the time it was SDCA or whatever they call it at the time. But yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like 2004 and 2005 they ran. There we go. I was, I was up there as a spectator in those years and had a blast yeah. watching you guys. Tanner and I went the W's. off the nearest corner that year. What did you say, Scott? Uh, Tanner and I went off at Engineer's Corner, the same spot where uh, Pastrana went off. That was 05. Oh, that that's, yeah. that's yeah. when the, the Pro Drive guys were running the Rally Team USA stuff up there too, yeah? yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, they came, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so all five was just from the start to the top. Then all six or all seven was the tall booth they added, mm. right? Okay. It was a nice Because I remember doing the tall, uh, because did. I remember race, sorry. Yeah, I think they did do a night stage too. On Pikes Peak, yeah. the toll booth, yeah. The toll, the toll booth was a nice, but that's the second year I ran it. Well, I was doing it with the open class car, the uh, Auto Sports. Um, what's his name? Uh, um, the Brian, Brian Shorts. No, mm -hmm. the Auto Sport. That was uh, oh, my Peter God. Workham. Peter Walker. There you go. That's it. Yeah, he was the, wow. the he couldn't he rented me the car and I did it with that open class car and we did a toll booth at night. But the year prior to that was when we did the just from the start to the top and right. when Tanner uh, had his mishap. And Man. was using his witching wiper to uh, spray his and, and a cooler. That's right. Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. That, that's, some, that's a rally trick right there for you. Oh, you guys yeah. listen to that story. <laughs> yeah. Quickly, because so we yeah. do that first race. And at the time, Tanner, me, and Todd Mobley, all three of us were in the same class. 
the well, I mean, and we see Tanner was with uh, with Scott. Um, we were in the PGT, whatever it was called at the time. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it was WRX stock WRX car. So we do the race, and after the race, we all go to Todd's Morbally, and uh, to watch videos of the race and everything. And Tanner shows up. He said, "Oh, guys, I got the inboard on my car. You guys want to see it? You guys want to see it?" He's like, sure, yeah, let's see it. And he puts it on a big screen. So there's like maybe ten or fifteen of us watching it. And as he drives up the mountain, I keep seeing his right hand flicking the windshield wiper. <laughs> and but the windshield wipers are not moving, and it's dry. And I'm like, "What are you doing over there?" He said, "What do you mean? Why do you keep pushing the windshield wiper?" I was like, "What? Oh, I don't see that. You must." I'm like, "Dude, I just saw you pushing the windshield wiper on your car. What are you doing?" And he just tried to backpedal because he got caught <laughs> spraying oh. his inner cooler with his windshield wiper bottle, <laughs> which yes. I was dying. And so since that day, we still give him shit. But, oh, you got a windshield <laughs> wiper bottle hooked up to your inner cooler today? <laughs> hey, so if he it got works, it works. That, but it was pretty funny. He was trying to backpedal that story like crazy. It was, it was pretty funny. Oh man, so, yeah. They, they, that's, uh, I think that was the inspiration for the, for the sprayer paddles on the S209, right, Scott? Right, right. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Which was a great thing. I wish I would have thought of it. I didn't think right. of it, but it was a great thing he thought of it. And uh, on on this car for Pikes Peak, originally when I ran in 2010, the intercooler water spray bottle on this car is a gallon. It's a windshield washer yeah. reservoir. So I was like, all right, we're going to run full spray up Pikes Peak on the intercooler. But the water only lasted like eight minutes with the nozzle I was using. So I, when the intercooler water spray light went on on the dashboard, I would flip a switch and the windshield washer reservoir would pump into the intercooler spray bottle. So we're talking a $2 modification and a switch. And then the light went off and it bought me another, you know, nine minutes of water to get out of there. That's awesome. Yeah. We, we had a, a similar instance with our water sprayer where we were running out of time with our water too. And so what we did was uh, we put a, a hazard switch in it. So a bit, so it would like multiply the length of, time that we had so we could get to the entire top that's That's a good one wow like like the the flashers like a flasher switch yeah just your simple hazard button that you put in any conventional car you just plug it in like a relay and hit it and it just yeah hey whatever whatever it takes whatever works right (laughs) well and dave so did you ever run the, the hill climb when it was fully dirt or did you start running it when they had start to, started to pave some of the sections? Yeah, so the, the first year I had a chance to run was 2007. Um, I was running my Mazda GTX. Um, and uh, let's see, the, the start line was paved uh, up to, um, I guess it would be picnic grounds. And then the entire rest of the road was dirt. And I believe the next year uh, it was the same way. And that was the first year I brought the Evo up. And then after that, each summer, they added about two miles of pavement. Um, But they didn't do it from the start line, working their way up. They did the start line to, um, to picnic grounds. And then they started adding um at uh glen cove at the brake tech station they added a couple miles there so then that next year basically the entire w's section was paved uh and then i think from there the next year they had prepped the entire section from the top down to boulder park um and so there were these nasty like two inch three inch like pink concrete um edges that lined the entire road on that top two miles but because of the weather they didn't have a chance to lay pavement down that year Um, so you had to drive really carefully up in the top section Um, and then right after the race was over they went and paved that section so the following year that was done Um, and then i think they finished the top section and then came back in and then finished uh i think the last bit that got paved was between um uh Glen Cove down um, yeah. to picnic grounds. So I, you know, not getting a chance to run it back when it was fully dirt. I, I you know, I, I don't have the opportunity to say, oh, you know, I really missed that. Um, but I thought it was a really unique challenge for the seven or eight years where you had mixed surfaces because you couldn't really commit to one type of car or the other. And I think that was really a great time for 
for privateers to have rally cars. Um, you know, now there's just, you, you can't compare to the, you know, the efforts that are, that are coming up. Um, you know, but back in those days, <clears throat> I think it was, was it, uh, 2011 or 2012, Stefan, that you were up with the Zenkai Subaru, um, you know, and, and the two of us, you were basically knocking a few seconds off me every single qualifying section. And then on race day, I was like, all right, I just got to pick a few corners and I'll see what I can do. And then we both had massive crashes on the exact same corner. Um, but, you know, it was, it, oh, man. Bike Speak's always one of those, you never know what you're going to get. The weather could change. Um, you know, and so it, it sort of used to be the, the ultimate equalizer where you could come up and you could race against these guys that you'd heard of, you know, growing up. Um, yeah. And now those guys are all in factory efforts and, you know, you're running two different races at that point. But uh, it, it's still really cool to, to be able to get up there and, and uh, hang out with some of the mo- motorsports heroes. So, For sure. I mean, do you think Pikes Peak is one of those races, like you mentioned it, I mean, we've all seen it where weather is like, is a, is such a factor. I mean, it is, you're, you're racing the mountain, you're racing the conditions as much as you're racing for a time. Is, is that one of the draws to the race? Cause is, is that one of the challenges? Because it's just any, anyone person, like if the conditions happen, be right. You, you you might have the opportunity to get that one run that, that just really puts you at the front of the pack, you know, no matter what, if you, if you're not a factory team or don't have a factory built car in one. Right. Yeah. The variables on Pike's peak are probably one of the most challenging because you're sitting there in the pits watching the sky for, you know, three, four hours waiting for the clouds to roll in. Cause you know, the clouds are rolling in every afternoon on Pike's peak just naturally. So um, it just trying to predict that and anticipate that for, for rain tires and, you know, trying to make that tire choice, um, the, the middle of the afternoon is definitely, definitely the optimal time of the day to run the race. But, you know, for, for us privateers, we're watching those big dogs go up the mountain and then we get to play the game, you know, after right. they get the, the sunny runs. But, uh, that's, that's the nature of the beast is that there's 45, 50 of us and that are playing that same game, you know, and, you know, we may not be the very fastest, but, you know, still trying to be top five is, is quite a challenge currently on Pikes Peak. Andy, I don't sure. know about you, but uh, I'm not going to pack a set of rain tires next time. I'm going to pack a set of snow tires. Um, I had a good half inch of snow on the road yep. at the top section. So I, I am books. Well, that's yeah. personal experience, right, Victor? <laughs> oh, boy, that was a year with the marble-sized was... hail. My, my truck got damaged, but somehow driving 100 miles an hour through marble-sized hail didn't do anything. And then the, Just the fog, right off. You, didn't have, you didn't have to drive with your eyes open at the top section because I only had like 10-foot visibility, and then a guardrail would pop up at 100 miles an hour. Right. And then uh, the front GoPro that no one's ever seen from my 2018 run the whole top section from Boulder Park to the top, it's just white. The road is white. It's like, this is, this is nuts. I, was, I almost took my seatbelt off. I was going to get the GPS out on the phone and start driving. Like, all right, where am I on this hill? Like, oh, okay, here, here we are. There's a, there's a hairpin turn coming up. I had that time at that point with the amount of snow on the road. So. Oh, my gosh. And then uh, I think the biggest part of, of popping up from that run was getting to the top, the summit, you know, I hear everyone's like, gosh, you know, I got so many comments. Aren't you afraid of crashing or dying? No, it was when I got out of my car, I started walking to the hut and I could feel the, the hair stand up on my arms. I'm like, oh, lightning. Oh, crap, it's lightning. Like, so I ran in the building and then everyone that was already there kind of stopped and gave me this look like, what are you doing here? Like, oh, I think I got the wrong summit house. Sorry, you know, yeah. it, was a, it was a surprise, you know, since, since the weather it just turned so sour. So yeah, what a... What a mountain. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, Colorado at the end of June, beginning of July, just like all, all conditions, rain, snow, hail. I mean, you, you get it all usually at Pikes Peak. It, it just at a different time. Sometimes all once. Yeah. And the I sand mean, too, the wind, right? Oh yeah. That's what got us on our year. It was windy. When we started, the weather was great, but it got windy uh, in that mid section and pretty much carry dirt from the, uh, next door uh, mountain onto the, the track and when we came in that corner I think 
him and I both crashed, and I think uh, two or three other car crashed in that same corner. And um, but yeah, the, not only you have the, the unexpected weather, but it, the wind also can carry dirt on the track. And since you're on slick tires, that's why I think when it was gravel, it was definitely an easier course to race mm. on and safer course. Yep. Even though people say, "Oh, it's gravel," but at least you had the same condition of grip mostly from the start to the finish. And if a car would have cut a corner before you and throw more gravel on the dirt, it wouldn't make any difference. Sure, when the sure. way it is now, you're on 100% slick tires. And if somebody cut a corner and put some gravel, you commit it, especially when you get to the top, when you have those, th those three left, uh, blind left turn over the crest, you, you have to commit it to be almost flat out through it. And if somebody cut the corner, you have gravel and on slick tire, you, you out. So it's kind of it. That's why I like personally the gravel better because it was, I think, a more even playing field for all the cars. When now it's kind of a, um, a roll of the dice. Uh, is the car for me going to drop some water or oil or gravel on the road? And I'm going to be, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, so it's unfortunately on that part. I think the tarmac, um, I understand the reason behind it for the, for the mountain. But as for the racing, I think it's more dangerous now on tarmac than it was in the gravel. And also the gravel was so much more spectacular to see cars coming sideways, even if they were doing 30 miles an hour sideways, it was yeah. more spectacular than the same car at 60 miles an hour uh, on, on tarmac. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Andy's probably the only one too. I mean, since you've run it, Stefan, like that dirt has been a problem. And then the road deteriorating up top, the tarmac has become into the, oh. it, like speed bumps. Exactly. So you see everyone bounce off the road. I think Andy, you're probably the most familiar with like last year's run was probably insane with how bumpy, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, it was it was quite drastic, uh, and Scott would know as well. We were very similar times last year. We were about a second <laughs> off on race day, and um, the the top section was super undulating. And throughout the day, you could see it change. Um, in the morning, the as it would be frozen, the road would be more shallow, like the dips would be more shallow, and then when the the ice would melt underneath the road the roads would deepen oh my so the God. dips would deepen it right before <laughs> wow. cut. so yet, a, yet another reason to qualify really well i guess huh <laughs> yeah absolutely but the problem was for me is i set up the car so soft i set it up for the top and yeah, i ended up losing fine. time down low and that's the other thing too when you were on gravel since we practicing at morning where the conditions are not even close to the race conditions on tarmac, when you were doing it on the gravel, the condition was pretty much the same. Right. So you practice actually during the week where an actual practice to set up your car. When right now, the only th reason you do the practice is to memorize the hill, but there's actually no setup you can do because you almost sometimes, I think one year we were running on, I put rain tires on. The mm -hmm. tires on, so at least it was this kind of the same amount of grip for practice and uh, I think we're losing a little bit there Stefan I apologize practice is so different than doing a race day uh, that it's pretty hard to do any setup so for for those of you guys who unless remember, you have the money to do the tire setup the tire practice they do like a three week before the race <laughs> that's right go ahead Dave so for those of you guys who have run you know more recently it seems like um the last time I ran, maybe three or four teams used tire warmers and, you know, wandering through the pits the last couple of years, it seems like we're maybe up to, you know, 70 or 80% of the teams that are using it. And it's definitely all the teams that are running in the top half of the field are, are using them. As somebody who's never used them myself, is that something that you find makes the road on practice mornings feel more like what it'll feel on race day? because of that extra grip or is it, you know, like Stefan said, where the road temperatures, you know, 25, 30 degrees on practice mornings. And then on race day, it could be 40 degrees or it could be 70 degrees, you know, or somewhere in between. Yeah. So on the top section for us, we wouldn't run tire warmers cause it was so unlevel up there. We couldn't keep the car in the air to put tire warmers on for a long period, but lower we would run them. And looking at the shift points, that's, that was what I was trying to compare was my shift points between corners and things like that. And when I started referencing the video right before I went up for my race run, um, I made about two corners in and my shift points were completely different. And I just threw all that thought process out the window. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I was counting corners and things like that. And it, it changed like first, second corner. Cause you'll realize that you're in the next further gear than what you were in practice. Gotcha. The speeds and temperatures. Mm-hmm. Well, I always, I always thought it would have been really cool if instead of an entire week of practice, they just rented the mountain for an entire day during the week so that you could actually get some practice, you know, in the middle of the day when, when temperatures would actually be similar to what you'd see on, on race day. But yeah. it seems like they like the tradition of throwing into race day without actually having seen what it's like. And so, you know, it, it kind of takes 10 years worth of experience up there to actually have an idea of what the road could be like on, on different weather days. Yeah, that's a good For one, sure. David. Come, I think all of us coming back from that first time, at least, you know, those that ran the road in the, in split dirt tarmac, especially is like, wow, that, that one, your first race run, when you run the whole mountain for the first time, you're like, wow, what a practice run that was. <laughs> right. Oh. Well, and, and just to clarify for people that, because they might not understand this. So, so Pikes Peak. The funny a, thing, just like I oh, uh, so, so Pikes Peak is a race week and you can test the whole week running up to the, to the race, which is on Sunday, but you're always testing first thing in the morning, like, like two, three, four o'clock in the morning until basically like eight thirty, nine o'clock and they kick you off the mountain because it opens to the public. So you're testing at high elevation in freezing temperatures all through the week. And then on race day, it starts at, you know, a more civilized hour and it, the temperatures go like, I mean, it can be 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees in the pits. And then, you know, the weather comes in. So, and then the, the other part of that is you're never testing on the whole mountain. It, at best, you're testing on maybe half the mountain, but usually it's more like a third and they just move you around through the week. So you're like the bottom third, the middle third, the top third. And, that's- and, and you get one shot get the whole thing put together and that's one time on race day and that's it. So you never get the full run until the, the first time you run the race. Yeah, that's mostly true. If you have a real budget, you're allowed to rent the mountain and do whatever you want. And so the sure. example that, that I remember hearing was, you know, when Sebastian Loeb came up with Peugeot and they were, you know, going for the record in the month ahead of the race, they rented the road. I think it was three or four times and so by the time race week showed up for him, he had more experience than somebody like me that had raced eight years. Um, and, you know, they always told us uh, Pikes Peak has several sanctioned test events where they're sort of in charge. And they usually run those instead of in thirds. I think they usually split the road into uh, the Pants. start line to Glen Cove and then Glen Cove to the summit. Yeah. Um, but some of these private test days, I don't think, there are really any rules about what, you know, what you can do since you've rented and paid for the road. And so I remember hearing from some of the photographers that were up uh, on the practice mornings that, um, you know, Loeb had a chance to make several full length practice runs beforehand. And that's the first instance I had ever heard of anybody getting a chance to do that. And, you know, it was like, oh man, that's, that's really cool. I wish I could have done that. But instead of, you know, having three shots to do it, you know, the week before the race, I, I did it a year ago, two years ago, and, and three years ago. And those were my practice runs. David, when, yeah. um, when I ran in 18 and the Volkswagen guys were up there, so that was actually fun. So, we, you know, we'd run the middle section practice and pull up to uh, Devil's Playground. And, uh, you know, there's Germans just running around everywhere. Just, it was fantastic. But there were, there was two guys running around and I, you know, not to mimic accents too much, but man, they had heavy accidents and like, oh, we love the anti lag in your car. And uh, so it just started a great conversation, you know, as I was popping up the canyon. But, you know, I just, I had an opportunity, like, guys, what, what is it, what did it cost you to, to run Pikes Peak? And they, uh, they said, we spent $30 million dollars to get to Pikes Peak. So maybe that was supposed wow. to be an internal secret. Now it's on the internet. But, you know, it was, uh, it was like, wow, 30 million bucks. So there you go. I think if each of us sold a kidney. We could... We'd be about 10% of the way there. <laughs> right. I, don't think they, I don't think they ever rented the mountain like uh, Loeb did. Because obviously Dumas knows the road. Yeah. Well, but they, they built two cars. There, yeah. there was, there was a, a complete spare car to run. So they built two of those IDRs. Well, that and means they had to have multiple trucks too for charging. Right. So a cool 60 million, we got this. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> wow. Well, and I mean, I guess we've, we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but it, I mean, it, the, the race certainly has changed since it's all been paved. 
it, and it, I mean, is it is it an entirely different race now than it once was, or is it still is it still Pikes Peak, or is it like is it its own animal now? I think uh, Dave kind of uh, shed some light on it with just it being fully paved now, and just the uh, the local ingredient with you know mom and pop operations. You're just not seeing that so much anymore, and I think that's kind of the the hill climb organization that's the direction they want to go mm. um obviously we've gotten rid of the motorcycles so that changes it quite a bit um, do, do you but, think in in part scott is it's because of the speeds that you know when you're when you're on dirt that kind of that kind of is a natural balancer to to like how quick you can you can get up i mean for example you know you look at rod millen's record that that record stood for what was it 12 14 years it was a long time but now that it's been paved, it's the record's been falling fairly quickly. I, I think one of the one of the things you have to take with a grain of salt, and and this is not to take anything away from Rod running ten minutes on dirt is just mind blowing. Yeah. But back in the the late eighties and early nineties, Pennzoil was an event sponsor, and they used to coat the entire road with mag chloride. And so if you go back and look at videos in the years when people were running low tens the road turned blue from the start line to the finish mm -hmm. line. And the other example I'll give is somebody like Paul Dahlenbach, fantastic driver, really quick in anything. He was running, you know, I think several seconds off and may have even had the overall record until Millen went up uh, that day in 94. Yeah. And Paul continued to basically run the race for the next 10 years. And if you look at his times, when they stopped doing mag chloride on the road, everybody's times dropped by about a minute. And so, sure. you know, to me, I, I can't imagine that Paul got a minute slower. I think the road was just not, <clears throat> not the same quality. Um, you know, and what you're seeing now with, with the tarmac stuff is you, you are seeing, you know, some of these factory efforts come up with amazing technology and just, you know, blowing all, all of us out of the water. You know, Logue was the first example in a, yeah. you know, combustion car where, you know, he basically came up in something proper and showed people what was, you know, what was possible. And then, you know, with the IDR showing what electric can do. Um, but I think if you look at the privateers kind of in this time frame you may notice that some of them were faster a couple of years ago. And I think, you know, to Victor's point uh, and Andy's point, you know, the road uh, up top is so terrible now that people are, are starting to go back to these compromised setups in terms of their suspension so that they don't get bounced off the road up top. Um, yeah. You know, and so I've heard rumors for the last five years that somebody was going to come in and repave the top section. And, and if that ever happens, that's going to be the year to try and set your, your PRs or, you know, the records are going to get set. And then maybe the following year will be okay. And then after that, it's going to just be a waiting game until somebody wants to pave the road again. And, you know, maybe it's going to be five year cycles. Maybe it's going to be 10 year cycles. I mean, hard, hard to know. Um, you know, the, the last year that I ran was 2014. So I'm, fairly removed now from what the pavement is like up top. I haven't even been able to drive it the last two years because mm -hmm. regular folks haven't been allowed up there with all the summit renovations. Wow. Well, and how much, how much does it change like th from, from testing to race day, that, that top section where there's, there's the frosties where we're basically underneath the asphalt, it, it's, it's freezing and it's melting and it's freezing. And it's melting just over and over and over again. Yeah, it's pretty wild uh, listening. I actually spoke with some of the guys that work up there. Um, they told me that they there's a hole on the top of the mountain that's so large that you could basically put a, a Volkswagen Beetle into, and it just keeps growing, and it gets deeper and deeper every, uh, I would say, every week, every two weeks. They keep dumping a truckload of rocks into it. So it's the mountain is literally moving out from underneath us every single day, not every year, every day right. it's moving. And it's uh, they to keep that they they had to be super gentle with the destruction of the of deconstruction and then using dynamite to for the new construction of the summit house. Um, it's been so it's the it's just the earth seems to be splitting up there. The mountain seems to be splitting in certain sections, and the water and freeze thaw is not helping the situation. But it's just the nature of the beast. It's a living and breathing yeah. thing up there. Andy, if you were paved, how would you feel? You would want to revert back to your dirt state. 
Well, you know, I would, I would. And, you know, I still have the Subaru and uh, uh, we kind of changed a couple of things to, from Subaru to Porsche because from a more undulating type of road to a, a paved surface. And now even the paved surface is undulating. Yeah. So um, having a Subaru up there or an Evo is, is totally more than fair and totally a justifiable vehicle to drive up the mountain. Has anybody taken a trophy truck up that thing yet? Like a true trophy truck? Not, not recently, but they're in the probably like 08 to 11 range. Um, there was a truck class that would come out and, and race. Oh. They weren't the super crazy ones. I think they were maybe 400, 450 horsepower trucks. So by the time they got to the middle section, it looked like they were low on power. Um, but man, those guys didn't lift ever. Oh, man. <laughs> it was fun to watch. Well, hey, Scott, what do you think about the top section? How how much does it change in the course of, of a practice week to race day? I mean, is it is it is that the biggest moving target on the mountain? I have not seen drastic changes in the top section. Of course, that's the area where you, you drive pretty conservatively. Mm -hmm. um, last year, we had a new um, a new frosty that developed at the entry to uh, Bottoms Pit, which caught Randy Pope's out pretty dramatically, right. and that was that was an interesting. Um, change to the course for sure i mean it sounds like when it was dirt it you just kind of like to your point dave it just didn't change as much it was a lot you could you could practice more you could feel more confident in in your run that that the road that you remember was going to be the road that you ran on race day but it seems like with the with the paving it's not quite that case anymore yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely part of it. The other, the other interesting thing is if you looked at the shape of the road um, <clears throat> back when it was dirt, you could use whatever dirt was there. And when they paved it, they made it, you know, two lanes wide and, you know, maybe a foot beyond that. And so the road actually got much narrower in a bunch of spots um, with the, the introduction of the pavement. Um, one, of the, one of the thoughts when you asked, you know, what's different between practice mornings and, and race days um, I'm definitely not the most sophisticated person in terms of car setup, but what I used to do is, um, on qualifying morning, I would get, I would do one run on the, on the tires that I plan to use on race day. And I would get the tire pressures dialed into where I like them. And I would just take them off the car and, and let them sit, put them back on for race day. And I think it was in 2009, um, it was really, really hot on race day. And I don't remember if we had delays going into it or whatever, but that year I was using, um, I think it was like a Yokohama. It was like a tire designed for a broken tarmac. Um, kind of had a chain link looking pattern to it. And I remember I had the tires dialed, everything felt great. And I left the start line. And by the time I was two or three corners up, it felt like I was driving on bowling balls. I had no grip. The tires were way over aired. Um, and it was just kind of a sketchy hang on, let's just make it to the top and not crash kind of thing. And so the lesson I took from, from that is, um, nitrogen in the tires because it's not going to change as much. Um, you know, and so every year since then, my, my quality tires and my race day tires had nitrogen in them to try and minimize the, the impact of, of weather changes on, on the setup. So John, yeah, I have an idea for you on the sense you're so you're so good at bringing communities together, you know, in all, all of this discussion right now, John, I think what we should do is figure out a way for you to start tapping government resources. This is this should become a cool project with our our friends with the USGS, DOE, satellite stuff. And yeah. uh, we get all the grassroots people some they'll they'll be doing some sort of cool study and we get satellite elevation data real time of the mountain weather information that's real time and you plot that in and i don't know it'd be some cool story just to say hey we we try and we, figure out pike's peak we tried to figure out pike's peak there you go well it, and, and that was one of the questions i wanted to ask you guys that run this have you ever had a race maybe maybe the race run or the race week go exactly according to plan because it seems like because scott i think is this going to be your 10th or 11th consecutive year i think it's 11 it'll be 10 10 it's oh. never gone to plan i mean we, we've gotten close but it's it's never gone exactly to plan are you, are you guys yeah. familiar with somebody called ahab you know uh, that might, might be going, familiar going after that whale right yeah that story i think ah. that's the whale yeah. 
<laughs> this, there's just something about this race that is, I mean, we, we've talked about it from the surface standpoint. We've talked about it from a weather standpoint. The, the thing is just a continuously moving target. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it is just such a, such a unique challenge. Yeah, I would say from the, it, there's so many variables, you know, it's from weather to air density, um, road conditions, temperature. It's everything. All of those things, all of those yeah. things come into play. Um, and like, I would say my, la my best run was last year, uh, was yeah. 2020, where nobody actually got to see it. Um, it, <laughs> right. Yeah. We, uh, we, we dropped an air filter on, uh, the mid middle section practice. Uh, that was one issue. We had a, uh, our, our kill switch needed to be rewired. That was the second issue. And a third issue was, uh, we broke off a tire stem valve stem as we were loading the tires to go up the mountain. So, and these are special Porsche valve stems that we had to get from an old rim in storage. Oh, wow. um, but usually uh, it's turbochargers replacements, engine replacements, we're Overheating. changing clutches, we're changing axles, we're changing absolutely everything under the sun. Um, and my saying kind of is to not be prepared is preparing to fail on Pikes Peak. Um, yeah. Just because there's so much to think about and try to anticipate because you can't anticip anticipate everything, but you can do your best. It's it, one of the things that I noticed when we first started running um, because we, we brought our rally car for the first two years and, and we had come from a rally background and like Scott and Stefan, you guys actually ran it as a rally. I mean, this is, it's a, it's kind of like a sprint race where a rally mentality is, is really the right mentality to bring to it because you've got to, it, you know, it's 12 miles, but you've got to bring every spare that you can possibly bring and, and plan for every possible contingency because it, it will probably happen in the course of that 12 miles or, or at least the one week. I think the, the, um, on the part side, um, the way I approached it the first year is the uh, tuning was the most important part because there's such a different elevation from the start to the finish. Yeah. And that was my biggest concern. The part, the setup of the car, I wasn't too, too worried about it because it is what it is. But the thing is the tuning is something if you blow up a turbo or yeah, because the, the difference and that was my biggest concern. I was even on the first year um, looking at renting a portable dyno and do mm. dyno runs during the previous week at different elevation to make sure the car wouldn't blow up and kind of ran, you couldn't afford it. So went different way, but it was that thing, the tuning on the, on the, for the engine is the biggest that like cooling and tuning are the biggest um, uh, problem at Pice Peak. The setup, sure. it could be a little bit sure. off, but because the conditions are so different from start to finish, you're never going to have the perfect setup for the mountain. Yeah. And so you can drive, uh, uh, fix the problem with your driving on the setup of the car, but the cooling and the, uh, the engine tune up is, is the most important. Uh, I mean, we went from extreme to a, uh, fuel in uh, dry ice for six hours before the race to make sure the fuel was pure cold when it was going into the car. And we just wow. fill up the car like wow. five minutes after we get we, we, before the takeoff. Um, uh, water sprayer on the car, wow. uh, dry, ice, dry ice around the, uh, the inner coolers all around the car to make sure everything stay cool. Uh, same thing with the tires, uh, like uh, uh, Dave was talking about. When I did my tires, I was using nitro from day one, but I would purge them like four times before yeah. I used the tire with the right amount of nitro because to make sure everything was perfect. So yeah, the altitude is such a problem uh, for the eating. And even when we test here in California, uh, we go to a, a local track and we use, there's three tracks and there's a track that is super fast and that is a track that is super slow with really a lot of technical turn. And that's what we do our setup on, not the fast yeah. track, but on the, on, the, on, the, on the the slow track. And because it's, it's at 100 degrees outside, so we know we can kind of simulate the temperatures. And we run the cars as hard as we can to see the brake the, and the engine temp uh, on that track. And we kind of put a rain setup on the, on the car versus a tarmac setup. That was the problem when I got with the Subaru, the Zenke is they brought a car with a full tarmac setup that you would run on, on a nice track. And at Pice Peak, it doesn't work because the tarmac is so dirty 
you have zero grip, zero grip with the tarmac setup. And the whole weekend, we couldn't change the spring rate. We couldn't do anything. And it was like a handful to drive the car. But the setup, but still make it work. Even the setup was completely wrong. We managed to make it work until I crashed. But it wasn't the, it wasn't the fault of the setup. So I think the, um, the problem is, yeah, is tuning and keeping those engines cool and be able to get the turbo to work at high altitude the same as the starting line. Uh, I think it's more important. When sometimes I think people focus a lot on the setup part of the car, chassis setup, and spend a lot of time on it. And when they could drive around the problem, but they don't, they kind of ignore, say we need the most power we can if I, I need that 600 horsepower. And yeah, but you could get away with 450 yeah. and make it to the end, no problem and win. And instead of the 600 horsepower. So I think it's, um, but like you said, it takes up, I guess, a lot of experience. Like Dave was talking about a bad lobe renting the mountain. Yeah. It takes a lot of experience to figure that one out and to say, oh yeah, I didn't need that much power. Uh, I learned that three years ago, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So one of the, one of the really cool things that's happened in the last, you know, 10 years, you know, going back to the talk about, you know, how do we make our turbochargers live? And, you know, obviously, um, Stefan, when you were, when you were up with the rally class, they made you run restrictors and that adds another layer of complexity where you can overspin the turbo even easier. Um, but you know, 10 years ago when I was putting my car together, we actually had three map sensors in there. We had one that was in the exhaust manifold so we could measure back pressure. We had one in the intake manifold so we could measure boost like we normally would. And then we had a third one just sitting in the engine bay that would read the atmospheric pressure. And there were basically tables that, that my tuner put together that would trim the amount of boost that you would run to try and keep things safe. And you know, my car back then, if I were going for, you know, a number on a dyno, it could have done about 650, but because I wanted to make the summit every year, we literally ran wastegate pressure uh, on race day. So we were running 20 pounds of boost, maybe 400 horsepower, 425, somewhere in that range. Um, but the really cool thing in the last 10 years is now you can get RPM gauges for your turbo. Um, yeah. And so what you can then do is you can talk to your turbo manufacturer and say, what's safe? Um, and so the cool thing there is some of the mar modern ECUs, you can actually do your boost control strategies based on the RPMs that your turbo is doing. And so, you know, if you want to make 600 horsepower at the bottom when there's plenty of air and the turbo can spin and, and compress that air, that's great. And then you actually, you know, can say, all right, I don't want to go over 130,000 RPM or whatever that number might be for your turbo. And so by the middle section of the mountain, maybe, maybe you're running 25 at the bottom, you're running 20 in the middle, and maybe you're only running 15 up top. But the cool thing is you're not going to overspin that turbo. You're not going to blow that thing up, but it allows you to kind of make safe power at, at different places um, along the hill. And, and the cost of those systems has come down so that now I think you can buy a turbo speed sensor for a couple hundred bucks. Um, whereas, yeah. you know, five years ago, it was probably a $1,500 item. Um, yeah. You know, so it, it's really cool that some of that tech has kind of trickled down and made it to the, to the point where it's, close to affordable uh, for privateer teams um, and, and data on the hill really helps tuners figure out and give you a good safe setup. David, that's where it gets so wild. Everything you mentioned too is like, man, it's exactly just so there's a lot of stuff to geek out on, but that hill, then we go back to the earlier part of the conversation. None of us have ever had it the same twice. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. It's like, okay, it's a completely different mountain right now in the next minute. Like, wow, yeah. what, a, what a thing. So I think it's something for all of us to appreciate. Like I, yeah, I, I, I think we all can dive so deep into these details. And that's probably the only place right now, at least in my, my, my racing since 03, where at least for Pike's Peak, I, I laughed. There was one year. So my first year, I rolled the car on the very, you know, not, not the first run, but it was towards the end of practice at uh, Boulder Park. Long story short, I, the steering linkage had come apart. So mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't know until we got the car back on the road on its wheels, it just destroyed but the guy was putting it on the truck and he was turning the wheel and it just clicked I'm like oh that's strange and sure enough we go in there and the the bolt that clamps you know there's splines on the the rack and right. there's a bolt that clamps it down the bolt wasn't even there it was just gone so i i basically had playstation staring up top but um <laughs> You know, I, I, I laugh because I remember going up the year before and here's my logic on Pike's Peak. This is what I'm getting my point to. Yeah. I took a rock 
from the top of the mountain. I was like, oh, this is, this is a good omen. Souvenir. Then, souvenir. Guys, in, when I, re, I crashed in 2010, I re-ran in 2011. The first thing when I did in 2011 is I returned the rock. I was like, now I pissed this mountain off. Yep. I got to put this back. <laughs> oh, yeah. There, there's so much about this race that it, it's you against the mountain or you're racing the mountain. Like the other competitors, all of you are racing the mountain. You just all happen to be doing it on the same day. The, right. the funny thing is, talking about racing the mountain, like the first time I went to uh, Pice Peak, uh, like I said, in our class, Todd Mobley was uh, one of the drivers, and his family is known on that hill. They've been racing that hill since I don't know many years. So the big advantage he had on me, he knew the hill and had no idea of the, the course. And like uh, Dave said, since you can only practice three days before, I'm like, that's not enough time for me to learn the course. So what I did, I came a week before the race, rented a car, and spent eight hours wow. on the mountain go up and down, up and down, up and down. I logged 750 miles that week just on the mountain to Did make sure. Know? Was your car great. checked each time through the station? Then yep. coming back? Yep. <laughs> and I, that was the game with the, with the temperature guy. I'm like, okay, let's see how low I can get the brake. Our low temperature, I can get the brake every time he checks me. For a week, he will see me up and down, up and down. Awesome. And the funny thing is, I only wanted to memorize the way up. I didn't care about the way down. So the way up, I would concentrate and pay attention to everything. And on the way down, I would turn the music full blast and look at the landscape. Don't look even at the road because I didn't want, I didn't want to use any brain cell on the way down. <laughs> I wanted to use everything on the way up. But yeah, I put 750 miles. So when it came to race day, I knew the place like, like the back of my hand, even better maybe than Todd because Todd only raced the, knew the road during race day. He never took the mm -hmm. time or a lot of drivers don't take the time to spend that much time on the road to figure it out. So like you said, racing the mountain, just knowing the, the course yeah. is the biggest part. And uh, especially now with the tarmac, when you have to be inch precise uh, at, on blind corners, uh, you better know where you're going and find the visual, uh, which mountain, what, which other mountain to look at to point you in the right direction for that left corner that is blind. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. one, of, one of the other questions I want to ask you guys, um, how much of a factor has aero been? And now that it's paved, is aero even more of a factor than it once was? Or does the, does the elevation, the, the fact that the air density just keeps going down and down and down, reduce how, how much of an advantage a really big aero package is on the mountain? I think from the gravel side, the problem with aero, when you side away, the aero doesn't work. Right. So when you were on gravel, uh, aero was important Obviously, it always is, but not as much because you spend a lot of time sideways. So a wing, as soon as it's sideways, doesn't work as, as well. So, but now, because it's tarmac, you never sideways, the aero is one of the most important thing uh, you can put on a car. If you have the budget to research it and to put it right, because putting a wing on the front, uh, if you don't do the research, can make it the car even worse than you think because you're out of balance, etc. So I think, and if you look at the cars now, the way they are, and you'll see um, Reese's car coming up the Bentley, uh, which is a track car, then they put the aero on it, it's just ridiculous. Uh, it's like two, uh, it's, a, it's a plane, pretty much upside down, upside down plane. So I think, uh, yeah, the problem is, and that's another problem with the privacy on air, uh, a lot of priority mm -hmm. don't have access to a wind tunnel or, sure. or even if you don't have a wind tunnel, mm -hmm. the money to build a wing that is custom to their car. Uh, but yeah, air is massive, especially since you have less density, you need such a big wings to compensate and you can only practice at altitude because if you have a massive wing and you practice at sea level, your spring rate is going to be so off compared to what you need on a race day. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a really tricky, tricky thing, but it takes a lot of money uh, to make it happen right and it is i think needed yeah yeah i think i think that's a big thing because you know anybody can you know strap a piece of plywood to the front and call it a splitter but <clears throat> if you get a chance to peek under you know the factory level cars the amount of detail work that happens underneath those splitters is just amazing um and you know the, the nice thing is with computers and, and CFD, you can do a lot of stuff on a privateer budget. Um, but then, you know, can you actually build the part exactly the way that the model was, you know, in your computer simulations? Um, and then obviously privateers don't have the budget to do actual wind tunnel testing. Um, so I think it's, it's definitely one of those 
areas where there's really not much way for the privateers to to keep up to the super high end cars. Um, but you know, it, at least speaking for myself, you know, I'm I'm hoping to go back um, next year, and my goal isn't you know a first place or a second place. It's uh, I would like to finally break the 10 minute barrier. Um, you know that that's the kind of goal that I'm going with now. Whereas you know when I was running in the you know, 2008 through 2014, there was a chance of getting on, on the podium. Um, and, you know, so maybe that was a bit of a driver, but I, I still feel like for me that the time was always sort of the most important thing. And, you know, if you happen to, you know, land a podium spot, well, great, that's, that's cool, but that's not really why I was going up there. It, it was always to chase after, you know, something on a clock. I think it's, John, you, you and Scott Crouch, you know, you, you, the, the effort you've put in with your car over the last decade, I think it's been that great example of just the one, the one thing we may not get, you know, three days of to the road ourselves, but I think we've all put in enough time to try out these, these single components. Like you, you can really understand the limit. You can understand your own limit, which is most, most of the time, the biggest issue, like most of the time we're beneath the driving capability of the car. Um, but then you, you've gone through and each year adapted something, you know, something from Arrow or even the tire change, like, wow, this, this, you guys remember the year you knocked 30 seconds off your time with a tire change and why did it do that down to the smallest detail. So it's, it's amazing. Even like Dave, I totally appreciate what you said about the map sensor. Like, yeah, it's brilliant. And now, yeah, we got all kinds of cool stuff. We can put sensors on the blocks, find out when the head wants to separate from the short block, find out the RPM on the turbo and like, oh, look, real numbers useful you know, that are somewhat at our level. So that's, that's kind of cool to give us the bigger picture. Cause I think we're all, we're all in our own, like R and D to understand this. Well, what I was going to say is that I think that we, we've been on the mountain long enough that we've seen, like, there's a lot of familiar faces. There's a lot of people that keep coming back and we see the teams that have been running. I mean, there's, there's some of these guys that have run, gosh, I think there, there's a couple guys that are getting close to 30 years in a row that they've run this hill climb. And then you see some of these guys that come in and you see them once and then you, and they just never come back. And I think a lot of the competitors that come back, it's, it's not, certainly there's probably a, a, a want to get on the podium, but there's like just this personal goal, like what you said, Dave, like, I just want to get under 10 minutes. And, and, and for us and our team, and Scott, you can speak, speak to this too, but it's just to try and figure this problem out, the problem of the mountain, the problem of the race, because it's, it's such a unique environment and a lot of the stuff that you think is going to work, it doesn't, or it, it doesn't work the way that you think it would once you put it on the mountain on race conditions. And it's just, it's such a unique problem that the challenge to try and figure it out to, to actually just make some inches forward to, to take some time off and, and get to like a 10 minute or break the 10 minute barrier. It's just such a, such a challenge. It just gets under your skin. You want to just keep coming back to try and move that, move that goal forward a little bit. Yeah, and I think I think Pike Speak is unique Multi because drugs. the car, you know, the car and the weather play such a role. But but I know, uh, I would imagine that everyone on here, as, as a driver, is going to say, "Hey, you know, I get to the top. All right, that's great. I, I I won my own race, but man, did I screw up coming through bottomless pit?" And you're like, "I know, I know, there was another second in there if I didn't do that." So it's like, "All right, you're you're sitting up at the top. You just finished, and you're already planning what you need to not screw up." you know, 365 days out. And it's just, yeah. it's just awful. Like, <laughs> because you don't have a chance to, to try it again soon. It's not like going out to high plains where you can come in, finish your session and go back out 10 minutes later and try and improve that one thing. It's like, it just kind of gnaws at you. Um, and it's, it's an expensive problem. <laughs> very, it's, very much so. Yeah. yeah. It's every attempt is separated by a year. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and it, was, it was funny you say that, Dave, because the moment I made it to the top, I was running through the list of complaints of what went wrong along the drive up, you know, and, <laughs> and trying to figure out and talk to other people. What, what, did, so what, did, what did you do? What tire pressure did you run? What, the, what, did you, what compound did you run? Okay. And then I look at their times and be like, okay, so he was right. He did, he did the right tire choice there. So I'm going to try that next year. And, uh, you know, like the caster conversations on another podcast, I was like, Ooh, caster, we need some caster in this car. So, so added some of that this year, you know, new suspension, things like that. So it's like, 
always one more thing. You try to take that next step and chip at it and chip at it and chip at it. And, you know, Scott actually, and you guys did a very fantastic job in making leaps and bounds. And last year I was actually awestruck because I, I dropped a bunch of money and bought a new car and you guys in a Subaru were very comparable same times Scott and I were going back and forth trading times all week long, you know, and, uh, yep. I was super impressed that you guys could pull that out of a Subaru with just some R and D and some technical changes that you guys did to the car. Cause I don't think you added much horsepower either. None. Well, we made a tire change that was pretty, pretty dramatic and mm-hmm. really helped us quite a bit. Went to the Hoosier. Um, and, and, and some suspension changes, but suspension changes. It, a right. lot of it, it was just, a lot of it was Scott, it, it was down to your driving because of the, the, the tires and the suspension. I think you're just able to utilize the car more. It, it, I would say it like just it, a confidence standpoint. I mean, and, and on Pike's Peak, I mean, that's, that's a lot. I mean, if you're, if you're comfortable and confident in the car with all these varying conditions, like that, that will take you a long way. A hundred percent, I think. That's one place by speak. If you don't have 100% confidence in your car, if you can, if you cannot drive that car without thinking about it, um, it will bite you and you're going to lose 20, 30, 40 seconds because it's such a long run. Something on a track, you don't have the confidence. You might lose a couple of tenths or maybe a second, but on by speak, it's going to be 30, 40 seconds. I remember my last race with a Subaru. That was the first time in my life when at a starting line, I was scared. I'm like, that freaking car is going to kill me. And, but I have to do it. I got paid to be here. I got to do it. And that was the only time in my life when I was scared and it did bite me. It wasn't the car's fault that I crashed, but it, it was, I was like, that was the first time I said, I'm like, I'm not doing this shit again because I'm in a situation where I can kill myself and it's not worth it. And, but again, and it was all because I didn't have the confidence in the car. And so I think, that, again, same thing, drivers um, that only stepped in their car for Pice Peak and they were and parked the car during the week, the, the, sun, the winter, the rest of the year, and just take it out the week before, I think it's a big mistake. Uh, I think that like you say, if people can spend a lot of time driving that car on different tracks just to get that confidence to know what the car can do, it will make, it will gain you a minute on the hill just because you can push the car and be confident in pushing the car with exactly the same setup. So uh, I think if, in general, I think people overthink the hill, the, t- the setup on the cars and everything before their own skills saying, okay, I need to spend more time me personally in the car before I put a new wing or a new turbo or a bigger set of brakes or blah, 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 because I'm not using that car to 100% uh, capacity as it is right now. But confidence, on the, there's one place, if you don't have the confidence, uh, it could be dramatic. Yeah, for sure. If it, it, it's you could say that too. I would every time I would go up before I've only gone up four times. This year would be my fifth. Every time I was thinking about the car and how I could save the brakes. I was triple pumping the brakes to get them to function, and then they start warping, and you can hear the turbo making weird sounds. So you're thinking about this. You're watching your gauges. You're watching this, and you're trying to you're trying to play mechanic while you're driving the car. And last year was the only year where I could actually drive the car confidently and not have to look down. Um, and I, I think that is because those, the, your car is super high strung on that mountain and it's just on the limit the entire time. And so you're just you having confidence in the car, not worrying about it and said, right. okay, you know what? Or, or you drive it in a way like a, uh, like a pro driver said, you know what? The engine blows up, fuck it, it blows up. I don't have to pay for it. So I'm going to push it to the end. <laughs> so. Hey guys, I got to run. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Yeah. All right. Good work. Scott. See you, Scotty. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good luck. Thank well, you. Uh, we have been actually going for a little while now, but uh, I, I did want to ask you guys, just, just as we're wrapping it up here, is there any other race that poses a similar challenge or has a similar pull to Pikes Peak or, or for you guys? Is Pikes Peak, like, is, like all the other races, like, it's, it's just – Pike Speak is always in the back of your mind. I think Pike Speak, that's why it's such a bucket list on a lot of drivers because the way it's ran, because of the mountain. And yes, there's a lot of other hill climb, but that's the only one where you, can, you cannot run it the full length until race day. Any other hill right. climb in the world, you can practice. You have five, six, seven runs 
full run and they take your best run out of the seven or whatever it is. So PySpeak is the only one I think in the world, unless I'm wrong, where you practice in condition that are not even pieces. close to the race day and you're not allowed to do a full run until the race day. You now you cannot see the track and uh, you haven't seen the track for 24 hours at best before your first run. So it's there's so much craziness in it. <laughs> that's what makes it so attractive to a lot of people. And that's why I think a lot of people do only do it once. They won't just mm. check that on the back list. Okay, I did it, done it. Now I'm going to go somewhere else where it's safer. <laughs> But um, so, yeah, I don't, personally, I don't see, I don't know any other race that could be uh, as technical as this one is and challenging. I, would, you I, I haven't run it, but I, I would say, <clears throat> you know, Mount Washington has that allure. Um, for me, I, I grew up on the East Coast outside of Boston and I would, I, I did nothing with cars when I lived out there. I didn't find out about racing until I moved to Colorado. Um, so for me, I would love to get out there and do that one. And the thing that's held me back is they have a rally class. So, you know, the Evo would fit into that. But if you want to run that, no the rules say you have to have a restrictor to carry a navigator. Ooh. And I don't want to carry a restrictor. So I could go out there and, and run solo. But, you know, for, an, for a road that's as technical and and tight and probably equally as dangerous um as pike's peak i, I want to go out there with a navigator and so i've just never been able to sort of reconcile or make a decision you, so i just sit here and watch are you allowed to uh, is that mountain open to the public like pike's peak is yep oh, nice. so, here we go do, do what i did rent a car and go put 500 miles on it you won't need a, na a navigator yeah. <laughs> how about you victor what what do you, is this is Pikes Peak the one that is always just kind of in the back of your mind? It you know it is it's you know I, I go back to the reference with Ahab again that things that place has been been my way all. I've never I've never had the perfect run you know 2011 we got the car fixed after the roll ran it I had a the uh, gearbox issue halfway up or we stopped you know same curtains you guys all crashed on the side road I stopped side road just with the gearbox problems looking at the views like oh I have no gears and then it's all the gear engaged and the it took a third that year, you know, in time attack, but it wasn't, it wasn't the perfect run. And it was the same thing of, of just being able to drive the car and not worry about the car. Um, so, you know, 16 was a different story. 18 is a different, 18. It was probably the first year I felt like I'm not paying attention to the car. I'm just driving. Car feels good. Then the weather kicked in and it's like, wow, I've never even practiced in the snow in this car with these tires. So, um, you know, the, I, I'd say Dave, you probably hit the nail on the head too. I think, you know, I, I haven't done it, but Mount Washington's that other piece. You look at that and I, I don't know if it's that dance with death, right? That Pikes Peak represents you. You certainly, yeah. you, you feel, you know, from, from doing something that seems to be so dangerous, you walk away feeling more alive than you ever have. And it looks like Mount Washington has that. So I, I do, you know, I love having it right up the road. I'm not Colorado, but at least it's, it's not a far, you know, endeavor to get to. You see all these folks coming from so many different countries around the world. You know, my trip to Japan was like that when I raced with those guys up there and seeing this whole community. You could go into a 7-Eleven and say Pikes Peak and someone just about anywhere in the world knows what you're talking about. You say Mount Washington, they're like, what? What are you talking about? Pikes Peak is just a universal thing. So, yeah. you know, uh, amazing like that for that bucket list experience. So in my head, I keep saying that nah, nah, is going to be the last time, but I'm, I'm positive there'll be more. Yeah. Well, and Andy, I, I think I know the answer, but, but for you as well, is it, is it, is this just, is this the race that is always with you? Yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's funny. Like I, I kind of devoted my life to it in that sense is uh, I, I work to, pay for the car to make it for Pikes Peak and uh, kind of every step that I do is in that direction to try to get me to making the car better or making making sure I can be there and making sure the team's prepared and, and all that sort of stuff um, wearing six or seven different hats but you know trying to do one thing I think Pikes Peak is a big enough event for some a privateer to it does it takes me a whole year to put yeah. the card back together and then evaluate what I did last year and how, what I need to change with all the results that had happened. Um, it is, it is definitely one of those things where 
my drive is, is kind of 100% towards Pikes Peak. I'm kind of devoted to it, but, um, and, and I, I appreciate the wife for, for <laughs> dealing with me through it all. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I would like to do like the green hell, you know, one of these days yeah. I'd like to go, go join Manthe racing and, uh, go check those boys out and see, see what the Nürburgring can do. And it, it's, it's very similar. Uh, I think it's higher speeds, uh, undulating, yeah. challenging, um, I would love to do a 24 hour event like Le Mans or Daytona, even a 24 hour event of any sort of kind is in my mind, it's kind of up that stature um, of Pikes Peak is to be a part of an endurance style event um, at, at a track like Circuit de la Sarthe or Nürburgring or mm-hmm. Daytona, even, even having those three types of events, having that in your back pocket would be one of those things for me that I think with Pikes Peak alongside would be tremendous. For sure. And, and you can tell that there's people that, that Pikes Peak is just, it, it fits into that. I mean, Romain DeMoss is, is the name that really rings a bell there where he's running at, you know, uh, Le Mans and then literally hops in a, in a custom jet to get over here fast enough to make tech inspections so he can run Pikes Peak a couple of years ago. Epic. Yeah, it just, yeah, it just, it, it gets, an, it, yeah, it fits that, this race fits into that kind of pantheon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, one of those sneaky things that I've wanted to always do was uh, do what the Unsers had done. If I could ever, one of these days, get a second car to run up Pikes yeah. Peak, fly a helicopter back down, go hop yep. in that second car and <laughs> take that bad boy to the top, that would be yep. fantastic. And it, it's, it's a, it, that would totally be cheating because now you had a run, now you know what, to ru- what you're in for up, up top. I mean, it's almost not fair. Right, mm-hmm. right. We just gotta tell the answers that now. You know? Okay. Well, no, I I'm pretty sure there's a. Person. I'm pretty sure there's a rule against that now. I think uh, the Leonard Vashholtz was probably one of the last people that did that. He used to race uh, that crazy um, Ford Bronco, and mm-hmm. then he would fly back down and, and run a Mustang up the hill. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be yeah. it would be cool to be able to do two cars. That's for sure. That would be. Sick. But if it takes me yes. an entire year to afford one car, do I yeah. only run every two years? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, well, you'd have to rent one or something, right? <laughs> That's right. A deep existential question there. <laughs> right. Well, we we have taken up a lot of time. I think as we're wrapping up, just uh, want to thank everybody here for joining us. Uh, thanks, guys. Well, he had to leave early, but thanks you guys for joining and, and being open to have this conversation. This is this has been a lot of fun, and man, we it's almost like uh, if they're going to hold the race next year, maybe we should do this again. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Man, so good to see all of you guys. Got to get, it's... get the band back together. Everybody's right. got to enter. Staff, yeah. you got a year to figure something out. Yes. Yeah, I got Thanks for letting me be a, a fly on the wall and listening to all your, listening to your stories. All right, Tasso, we got to push you up next. Yeah. Yep, you're up next, Tasso. You tear, up, uh, tear up asphalt. I can only afford like two sets of tires a year, so I can afford tires too. So. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you're out at High Plains, you've already got the setup done, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, there you go. We'll see. Well, thanks very so much again. Guys. Good luck for the uh, one racing. We'll be, I'll be yes. watching. And uh, no, actually, I won't be watching. I'll be racing so too. But <laughs> good luck. Yes. yes. Good and, luck uh, to you. Have fun. Be safe. Thank you. Yes. Have fun and be safe. Yes. Thanks so much, guys. We'll we'll take care and thanks to everybody for listening. And uh, until next time, stay tuned with Flatirons Tuning. See ya. <laughs>